the UK. Um, and that we want to launch small satellites into space uh, from beneath high altitude balloons. Mm. Uh, so before I uh, started out here, I got my PhD from the University of Bristol, as Pablo said, in engineering origami, uh, which is the topic of today. Um, yeah, if you have any questions and you want to fire them away, again, yeah, like Pablo said, in the chat if you want, or feel totally free to interrupt me. Um, if you want, you can interrupt in Spanish and, and the translation can come and um, that's totally fine too. Whatever, uh, whatever you want. I'm very flexible uh, to interruption. So what is origami? Well, it's the ancient Japanese art of paper folding. Uh, the word origami itself, I looked it up, apparently it's the same in Spanish that it is in English, which is good, um, um, because this bit makes more sense. And it comes from the Japanese for uh, fold, which is ori, and the Japanese for paper, which is kami. So fold paper is ori kami. Um, you might have done origami yourself at some point, folding your flat sheet of paper into a beautiful crane. Um, but you might be thinking, what is an aerospace engineer doing with origami? Are we just making paper planes? because there doesn't seem much use in paper planes. Um, but you can actually make some extremely complicated shapes by simply folding a flat sheet of paper into some interesting 3D origami shape. Um, and I can hear the question cutting through uh, the, uh, the internet, and that is, how complicated can you actually go by folding paper? You know, a crane doesn't really look like a crane. So, you know, what kind of shapes can you get? And that answer is some extremely complicated shapes. And so all of these are actually photographs of real origami uh, folded from one sheet of paper uh, by someone called Robert Lang, who has a lot more skill and patience than I could ever, ever dream of having. Um, I particularly like the kind of fine detail that you can get. Uh, so if you look at the cactus on the top left, those spines that you can get those fine details out um, and just on that cactus. So the one side of the paper is green and one side is red. And so he's managed to use that to get red, a red pot and a green uh, cactus all from one piece of paper. Um, I also quite like at the bottom there that the bee if you look at the knees, you can actually see the detail of the knees. Um, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that origami is literally the bee's knees. Uh, and you can get whatever shape you want with careful folding um, and a lot of patience. So how do they actually manage to create such intricate and carefully sculpted designs? Uh, and the answer is actually quite beautiful, really, because it's mathematics. And so this is one of those rare instances where art and STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, where they cross over and you use maths to get beautiful art, which I think is quite nice. It's, it's nice to, to cross the two. Uh, and so the object or, or creature that the artist wants to create is simplified into a stick model uh, of the intended shape. And there's algorithms that you can use to give you fold patterns like this one on the left. So the beetle at the bottom, again, it's a photograph, um, that is folded using the pattern at the top. And that's a series of mountain and valley folds. So a valley fold is the fold you would get if you had a book on your desk and it's pointing down, the fold of the book is pointing down into the desk. And a mountain valley is if you turn that book upside down, uh, kept it open to read the cover, you then have the fold pointing up uh, away from the desk. So what we've got here is we've got an art where you can create complicated 3D shapes from a flat sheet of material. And the process to get between the two is very mathematical. Uh, so clearly, it's piqued the interest of engineers. 
so what are the rules of engineering origami? Uh, well, there's, there's three rules and, well, there's three guidelines because you can break all of the rules in various ways and we'll come to that as we go. Uh, the first rule is that you can't stretch the material at all. There's no in-plane deformation. You can't stretch it or shear it. Uh, the second is you can't bend the material. You're only allowed to put sharp folds in, sharp creases. But the third one is that you can't cut your material. Um, it's actually a slightly different discipline if you do. So if you relax this rule and say that you can cut the material, that's a discipline called kirigami, which is a whole other field that we will leave on one side for now <laughs> and not go into today. Um, but what do these rules actually mean? What, what are the implications of these rules? Uh, so the, the main implication is that you can't change the Gaussian curvature of your material. So this basically means that you can't have something that's doubly curved. Something has no Gaussian curvature if it's a cylinder that only has one direction of curvature, but a ball or a globe like the Earth has two curvatures you have. So if around the Earth you'd have latitude and longitude, you have east, west and north, south. There's curvatures in both directions. Uh, and that's why you can't um, take a rectangular map of the Earth and write accurately the sizes of all the countries on it. Uh, because you can't without bending or stretching it. And that's why if you see a rectangular map of the Earth, it's telling you lies about the size of Canada, Greenland and Russia, because the north of the Earth has been stretched to make it bigger so that it will fit onto a nice rectangular piece of paper. Uh, so to go back to origami, if you stick to these rules, you can actually describe the behaviour of origami as a mechanism uh, using something called rigid origami. So this makes the assumes that you are following these rules. You assume that the facets are perfectly stiff and the folds are perfect hinges. Uh, so facets is a term that I might use a few times today and it basically means the material between the folds. Uh, so you could say that your origami is a set of facets connected together by folds. And rigid origami would be a set of really infinitely stiff facets that are connected together by perfect hinges that have no stiffness and can just move and flop around as, as they please. <coughs> so if we make these rigid origami assumptions, uh, then we can design actually a very interesting pattern for our, in engineering called the Mura Ori. Uh, this was discovered by a chap called Koryo Miura. Sorry about my Japanese pronunciation. Um, and it was named after him. It's the Miura Fold, Miura Ori. Remember, Ori was fold in Japanese. Um, and uh, the rules that we've done, and the, um, the rules that we had uh, above, they come together, so the, the rigid origami uh, comes together into this pattern to give it a single degree of freedom. Um, and what that means, it, sorry, there's two important things about this pattern. The first one is that it has a single degree of freedom, uh, and that means it's a perfect mechanism. So theoretically, you just need to pull in one direction or just rotate one fold and then that's transmitted equally throughout the entire structure which is obviously great for a deployable structure because you can just actuate in one location and the whole structure just unfolds neatly you don't need to there's no process at all you just do it the second interesting bit about this is that you can tessellate it in a range of ways. So what that means is that you can stack them together next to each other. So like the image at the bottom, that you've got one cell, which is the sort of greyed out bit in the bottom right, uh, and that's tessellated into a sheet. Um, you can stack these sheets on top of each other and make a block, uh, or you can make them into a tube 
So if you look at the, the cell on the left, if you were to mirror that in the XY plane, so that's the sort of bottom plane, you could make a tube cell and then you can stack these tube cells next to each other um, to make a longer and longer tube. Um, and what this really means, what I want to try and get across by this is that you can get some really interesting structures that you can fold away into a compact and neatly folded package uh, in just one motion uh, whenever you want to. Which again, as I said, that makes for a really great starting point for designing a deployable structure. So let's talk a bit more about deployable structures. Uh, as I'm sure you know, deployable structures are everywhere down here on Earth, from the obvious kind of scissor lift on the left to the unfoldable bridges that you might have uh, in the army, or the slightly less obvious one, which is a letter folded into an envelope. Uh, this uh, this last one's kind of easier to see the origami application because a very simple origami is a folded piece of paper folded up and put into a folded envelope. Uh, so you can definitely see the where origami starts to come into this. But basically what we're saying this deployable structure is, is it's anything that can change from something very small to something much bigger. And deployable structures are all over the place in space as well. Uh, so we have solar panels or radiators, like on the top left there, uh, which have to fit into the fairing. Uh, booms that can provide structure for payloads, uh, or even that bottom middle image, uh, structure for a solar sail, um, which is a neat way of skimming around the solar system by having a, a really large kilometre square reflective piece of material. And then the light, the photons from the sun bounce off it and give it a little bit of force to push it uh, faster or slower. And you can quite nicely get around the inner solar system without any fuel. And you could fold that away with origami and you could use these deployable booms as well, which is quite a neat little um, application. And the other one that I've got on here is expandable habitable modules. So there's the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, or BEAM, um, that's currently on the space station at the moment. And that was attached to the space station and then inflated to deploy and grow its capacity uh, after it had arrived. So this slide is an excuse to show some cool rocket pictures, full disclosure there. Um, and it's also to address why we need deployable structures. Surely it would be cheaper and easier and more reliable uh, to build the structures the size you want them instead of designing these complicated mechanisms that need to be actuated in space. Uh, and the answer is fitting inside that fairing at launch. Satellites are not aerodynamic. Why should they be? Um, they spend decades orbiting where there's basically no atmosphere. Uh, so it'd be a massive waste of space, weight and effort to make them aerodynamic. But as the rocket is speeding through the atmosphere at supersonic speeds uh, during the launch, it's really important to protect that boxy satellite with an aerodynamic shell. And you can't make that shell too big. So... To put the size problem into perspective, if you look at the area of solar panels on the space station, so just hold that image in your head, you can see the space station. Well, the area of solar panels would cover approximately half of a football field. But to be able to launch it, you need to pack all of that away into a volume that's not much bigger than the goal. So you can see how efficient packing is really important. Uh, and that makes origami such an inviting prospect to make best use of that volume uh, that's inside the fairing. So I just now want to come back to that really rather special piece of origami that I mentioned earlier, the Mura Ori, uh, to have a look at where it's been used so far. Uh, so the first one is a Mura Ori inspired solar panel, uh, which could be deployed and then retracted. Uh, it was launched by Japan in 1995 on a satellite called the Space Flyer Unit. So the satellite deployed its solar array successfully 
operated for 10 months before retracting it again uh, and being recovered by the Space Shuttle Endeavour in 1996. Uh, and the recovery is the photo you see on the top left. Uh, the idea was that the satellite could be then refitted with new technologies and you could fly the same satellite again. Uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, and in the end, it's uh, in a museum in Tokyo, in the Museum of Nature and Science in Tokyo. Uh, but the idea was that this origami solar panels, they could be deployed and retracted really easily so that you could deploy it, operate it and then retract it so that it could be recovered uh, by the space shuttle, brought back, refitted and launched again, which means you don't need to rebuild and redesign your all of your satellite bits. You can just bolt on the new things that you want uh, and reuse satellites rather than leaving them in orbit, which is space debris, um, or just building new ones, which is really expensive. Um, as an aside, this is my personal favourite photograph of origami in space. <coughs> uh, it's a shame that the origami is packed away, but it's just so cool that A, the space shuttle was really cool, uh, and B, it's really cool that it, they could actually use the origami to deploy and retract uh, rather than just deploying it and then that's it. We can't fold it back away again. It's the ability to to put it out and back in again, um, which meant that they could recover it at all, uh, which, yeah, like I said, is really neat. Uh, so the space fly unit used a conventional Miura Ori sheet, just like on the bottom of the slide. Um, but more recently, uh, NASA and Brigham Young University in America uh, have been working together to design an alternative uh, pattern which wraps around the spacecraft. It's still inspired by that Miura Ori, um, but it is wrapped around the outside rather than folded back into a sort of straight line like you see at the bottom here. Um, and that means that you can actually make use of spinning the spacecraft to make use of the angular momentum of that spin to deploy the solar panels and then that spin will also keep them rigidly deployed, which is a really neat solution to both the actuation and keeping your deployed um, origami in the place that you want it to be. You roll both into the same. So I think that's a really quite cool um, solution that they came up with. So alternatively, you can tessellate the Mura Ori into cylinders and tubes. And so these are great for uh, using as booms or as like structural reinforcement for other origami to help it all deploy together. And the advantage is that this deploys just in one direction. So the one on the left um, was a, a cylinder which could be packed down and folded into a stowed shape. So that's on the on the top left. It's all folded and stowed away. And somebody's pensively watching it. Um, <clears throat> before you'd inflate it. Um, and that would deploy it to its full length. And you can actually, if you look closely, you can still see the fold lines. Uh, are the creases are, are left behind in there. Uh, and the interesting thing about the way they tessellated this pattern was that it was stable in the stowed state and stable in the deployed state. Uh, and I'll come back to multi-stability later, uh, but what this really means is that it's much easier to hold it in those stowed and deployed states. So next on the right, uh, we have a deployable tube which you can extend uh, by just squeezing on one end. So if I play the video, So again, the idea behind this was to provide support and guide more flings, flimsy deployable structures to the final shape. So I'll just play it again. And you can see you've actually got two tubes stuck together and he's manipulating it at this end and that is deploying it all the way out. And you can get a nice, a lot of deployment from a relatively small um, package at the start, which is 
Sorry, I'm just nerding out about origami. It's really neat. <laughs> I couldn't talk about deployable structures without mentioning these guys, though. So these are a group of Danish engineers who wanted to design a habitat that could be deployed on the moon, because in the Artemis program, we're going back to the moon by 2024, hopefully. Um, and the idea was this was a habitat which could be taken nicely, compactly stowed, and then you could unfold that in something much bigger um, and live on the moon. And so they designed one and took it to Greenland instead, which is again, quite remote and um, hard to get to. Uh, and so they, they designed their um, origami habitat, took it to Greenland and lived in it for a few months. Um, and this is the time lapse of them deploying it. So you can see it gets a lot bigger. So it, it, it's probably about the height of a person there, roughly. And then it gets big enough that several people could live in it. Um, and that's a really interesting area for origami to go down and, and follow into is this idea of the deployable habitat um, and growing this idea for um, space applications because uh, quite soon the International Space Station will reach the end of its life and I think that there will be an appetite for more people to live and work in space and so there needs to be somewhere for them to live and work and so having a way of sending up more volume with less rockets is going to be really quite uh, an attractive proposition uh, in the next decade or so. <clears throat> so if origami is so great, why is it not everywhere? It's a fair and important question for any engineer to ask, and there are clearly some challenges left to overcome. So first we have that these origami structures are quite challenging to manufacture. They have to be folded really carefully and precisely. Uh, and for some, like the Mura Ori, uh, because they only have a single degree of freedom, all of the folds have to be folded simultaneously, uh, which makes manufacturing quite difficult because you need about 79 different hands to hold it in all the places you need to hold it and then fold it all together. Next, we have the challenge of material choice. Uh, so what we want is we want those facets, the material between the folds, to be as stiff as possible whilst also having a very low stiffness material on the folds. So this means we need a material which becomes very compliant when it's folded, but is stiff before you fold it. Um, or we need different materials for the facets and the folds, both of which present quite a challenging manufacturing prospect, which is back to that first challenge. So next we have the actuation of these mechanisms. So conventional linear actuators would probably be far too bulky to include in these slender, lightweight structures. Uh, so we need to lean on some more exotic smart materials or other methods, which we'll come to in a second. And also in the real world, <coughs> the Mura Ori is not a single degree of freedom, uh, and we'd need to distribute a set of actuators across it. And again, I'm going to get to back to that point in just a second. Finally, we have the challenge of how you would lock it into position. Uh, so we want the deployment mechanism to be really compliant and easy to move. Uh, but once it has been deployed, we need to stiffen it so that it doesn't retract again at just the slightest nudge. So I'm going to talk about those last two challenges a little bit more now. <clears throat> but let's start off by looking at the actuation of origami. Uh, because it's often very, like I say, it's very lightweight and flimsy, it's really important to be quite careful about how you choose to actuate it. Uh, so I'm going to go through a few of the different uh, thoughts that people have had so far on how you might achieve that. Uh, so we already mentioned quickly about using air pressure to deploy a boom in that single shot, uh, but for that one you couldn't then deflate it and fold it back away. Uh, and so this one on the top, that's what they looked at, is they looked at increasing the pressure to, to deploy it and decreasing the pressure to bring it back down to a smaller shape again. Um, next up is the if you go down one picture, you have this earwig. Um, and it's the same for a lot of flying insects, and it's absolutely amazing. So what they do 
is they use elastic energy stored in the wings to deploy them when they open their wing covers. Um, so the thing that's really amazing uh, is watching how they manage to use their bodies to store the elastic energy by carefully folding their wings away when they land. Uh, next time you see a ladybird land next to you, watch very closely at what it's doing with its wings, and I promise you will be amazed. Uh, you could also make use of some exotic smart materials. That's one down here at the bottom, uh, like shape memory alloys or shape memory polymers uh, to give you an actuation. Uh, so these materials will change to a predetermined shape when they're exposed to a high enough temperature. Uh, and then shape memory alloys specifically will change back to their original shape when they cool down. So you might just pass a current through a wire and it will change shape. You stop passing the current through the wire, it will go back to its original uh, size. And the last one that I've included here is to use strings, uh, almost like an origami puppet. So pulling a string will shorten the distance between where the string is attached uh, and cause the origami to lean to the side where the string was. Uh, so this has been used in origami, prototype origami robotic arms, because if you put all the strings around the outside of the cylinder, you can turn towards any one of them by pulling the relevant string. <clears throat> so, I said earlier that theoretically the Muir RE has just a single degree of freedom, so actuating in one location would propagate to the entire structure. But, in reality, physics takes over. Uh, and the facets are not perfectly rigid, uh, and the folds have some finite stiffness. So what this means is that if you actuate in one place, so for example you squeeze this tube at the bottom at one end, then the effect of that, then what happens is those, the facets, the material between the folds, that bends and stretches, and the effect of that actuation gets less and less as you get further away from where you did it. Uh, and what this means is that you actually need a network of actuators across the entire structure to get the deformation that you're looking for. So we're all engineers here and we know what that means and that's that we need to simulate things. We need to know the mechanical or structural behaviour of our origami to be able to properly design it. Uh, so there's two main approaches to this. The first is much quicker and simpler, uh, but perhaps loses some of the specific detailed responses, uh, and that is to try and improve that rigid origami model. So if you remember, I said that it assumed that the facets were perfectly stiff and the folds were perfect hinges. Well, let's see if we can't improve that. So first, let's think about the bending of the material between the folds, the facets. So to be able to capture this, uh, we can add an extra hinge. So this is our, our Muir RE unit cell. It's got one, two, three, four folds. And if we add more folds along the long diagonals of the facets, then that, in a basic way, captures a bending of the facet because they can now bend around the middle. And what we can do to take it a bit further is we can add a torsional stiffness to this new hinge that is representative of the bending stiffness of the facets. And we can add a torsional stiffness to those original folds as well that is representative of the torsional stiffness of the fold. And the last little extra that we can do is we can add elastic bars to like a truss structure that goes along each of these folds or bends that we've, we've captured. And that gives a little bit of understanding to how the facets might bend and stretch. So the second option is more complex and time consuming, but potentially more accurate. Uh, and that's to use fi a finite element analysis package and simulate the origami in there. So we can use shell elements to model the facets. Um, and there are two potential methods of modeling the folds. So we could either use hinges with a torsional stiffness again uh, to model folds, or we could use bent shell elements to model the folds. 
Uh, so that's the material that is the facets. And instead of on this one, you can see this, this is with hinges. They come together at a sharp point. You'd model a sort of bend around the corner. Um, and in reality, both tend to get used. If you are more interested in the nuance of what's going on at the folds, so these structures are often used in energy absorption um, applications because the folds move a very long way. And so energy is force times distance or moments times angle. And so you can actually absorb a lot of energy with these structures. If that's what you're trying to model, then you're really bothered about what's going on in the folds. And so you want to model it as a bent shell to try and really accurately capture what's going on there. But if you're more interested in a deployable structure, you're interested in how the structure is behaving as a whole. And so you're happy to sacrifice a little bit of exactly what's going on at the fold to see what's going on as a whole. And so there you might use these hinges with a torsional stiffness instead. So once the origami has been actuated, it has to be locked into place to hold it in the final shape. Uh, so for actuation, ideally, we want to have a really low stiffness in the deployment direction. You want it to be really easy to fold and unfold your origami. Uh, and that means that you can actuate it using less force and therefore less energy. Um, but once you've reached your target shape, you want the origami to then become rigid. We don't want a slight nudge to either deploy it a little bit more or retract it a little bit so it deploys a little bit less. Um, and that's where that multi-stability that I mentioned earlier really comes in. Uh, so we can push one of these unit cells from one side and it pops through to the other. So to explain a little bit better about what's happening there, I want to do a little thought experiment with you. So I want you to imagine a ruler. All imagining a ruler, good. So if you compress that ruler slightly, it will buckle and the ruler would now be bent. You could see the ruler curving from one side to the other. And what you can do is you can push on that ruler and it will go towards the middle, towards the middle and then pop to the other side. So that ruler is, because it's buckled, you've made a bistable structure. And that is the same thing that's happening here. You've got the Mura Ori is sort of curved in one direction, pointing upwards in this case. These are all pointing up towards you. And then what somebody's done with this one here is that they've pushed it towards the middle and it's popped into the other direction. And what you've done is you've disrupted the way that these folds are rotating. And so around this area where you popped it through, you've actually made it stiffer. And so it's harder to move that, change the shape of that origami once you've popped it through in that direction. Um, and so you can use that once you've deployed your origami to hold it in place and stop it from retracting again. So you can actually get a few more benefits from this multi-stability, and that is the ability to bre start breaking some of those rules that we set down at the start. Um, so if you look at the, the two images here, which are both real photographs of origami, these are not computer generated images, um, they appear to be breaking the rule that I said we had earlier. So this top one, this looks like a ball or a globe and it's folded from flat material and it's happily sitting there. So it, you know, it's stable in that shape that it is. But how have they got a flat material into a globe? Because we can't map the globe with a flat material. Um, and what they've managed to do is they've managed to locally in a few places break the rule which means that overall, that and that rule that we're talking about is those origami rules, the no bending and stretching um, of the, the facets. And that means that they've been able to get this stable sphere uh, folded from a flat sheet of material. Um, 
and the way that they do this is that they've, they've so they've creased the folds on a flat sheet and they start folding it and they have to push it and it doesn't want to move they have to keep pushing it through this energy barrier it doesn't want to go past it um, as you're starting to fold it up you're starting to fold it up and then it reaches a point where suddenly it's more energetically favorable it really wants to pop to the new shape uh, just like the ruler pops to the other side once you get to that point you have to push it push it push it and then it pops to the other side it's the same with this and uh, both of them is that you start folding it it doesn't want to move it doesn't want to move it doesn't want to move and then it pops across to the other side um, and then it's happy where it is on the other side so you've had that the, the thing that's fighting against you is the facets bending and stretching um, and so you you bend them and stretch them more and more and more and then you pop it across and you hit the other side and then they're not so bent and stretched um, because it's happier where it is again like the ruler you push it across the ruler's got more and more strain as you get close to the middle and then it pops out to the other side and suddenly it's not quite as strained anymore uh, and this is <coughs> what this represents here where you have flat sheets of material that can go to different 3d shapes is the first step on quite a long road to be able to properly exploit the potential of origami it's not hard to imagine a leap from here where you've got these quite simple shapes simple but mathematically complicated shapes to jump from here to fabricating any 3D object by simply folding a flat sheet of material in the correct way. You could print off whatever you wanted in 2D with a pattern and fold it up into your 3D shape. And so then anything could be manufactured on the same machine and then just fold it into shape. A long way down the road, but you can see where the potential of this really lies. So thanks for sticking with me through all of that. Um, I just kind of want to summarise before I uh, finish up and we have any questions. Uh, so I hope what I really want you to get out of this is not to have a really deep understanding of how origami is modelled or um, all of the exact methods of actuation. What I really wanted to do was open your eyes a little bit to taking that art form of origami and applying it to solve engineering problems in deployable or morphing structures. Uh, and I also hope to have seeded some interest in solving some of the problems between the current day where origami is very much something that is the focus of academia to a future where industry can make use of this as a really powerful tool um, so thank you everyone for, for listening to me going through that this morning uh, and I hope that you really sort of found it interesting and engaging uh, and uh, I wonder if anyone has any questions. Okay, so I normally this goes as it follows. Nobody wants to ask anything, so someone asks something and then maybe someone gets a little bit braver. So let me start by asking a very simple question. Uh, from the point of view of uh, industrial application, uh, this technology, at which level we can find it? Find it? I mean, uh, we've seen it already in some uh, satellite examples, but uh, I don't know if this is really a technology that has been applied in more uh, specific cases than the ones yeah. you already presented. Yeah, this, this is very much a, it's never been used as a an industrial tool. So the, the, the image that's on the screen now, the space flyer unit, my favourite photograph. Um, so that one, that was a technology demonstrator mission. So it was always intended to just demonstrate that it, it was possible. And a lot of the other applications, they have been very much focused on demonstrating that it's possible um, rather than using it. Um, as an industrial tool and it's those challenges of um, it being very difficult to manufacture um, and you know not knowing exactly how you combine your materials to bring it together I think that have been a bit of a blocker and also the actuation challenge of 
so what this one did is that you had a boom on each side and then the boom was extended out and so you sort of pulled both sides of your origami to unfold it and then you brought the boom back in um but then you had a massive boom so you kind of you didn't have the same benefit of weight saving that you would necessarily have if it was embedded across it it was not reaching the same potential um and so yeah i think the challenge to to bridge the two is is these challenges and <laughs> um, that that manufacturing material choice and actuation and yes uh other thing that when i was listening to you uh yes the question up here is why we stick with the mura or there are no other I don't know, let's say like the most elemental uh, origami is the Mura Ori. Can we find another elemental brick to build the, the whole origami uh, structure? Yeah, there are a few uh, other sort of, I, I like the term brick, it's a good one. Um, there are, there's a few other um, things like that. Um, so the, you have the von Reich pattern, I think. Uh, and what that pattern does that differently to the Mura Ori is that it has more than one degree of freedom. So there's more than one way of folding it. So you could push it down. I think it might only have two. I can't remember. But you could. the point, the, the point is you can push it down different paths. Uh, and the I've sort of focused here on the Mura Ori, uh, which you just push down one path. Um, and that's the advantage and why it's been use so much is that his it has that one path that you can follow um you can pop the cells through and, and make new paths but then you're you're playing with it a bit and so you, you you're breaking the rules as it were um and so that's why the Mura Ori has been the focus um the other interesting thing about the Mura Ori is it has a negative Poisson's ratio um which means that if you stretch it in one direction it expands in the other direction as well um, so normally, if you think of play dough, you you pull it or you know bread dough, you pull it in one direction, it gets thinner in the middle. Uh, with the advantage of the Mio Ori is you pull it in one direction, it gets fatter in the middle, uh, which is again great for a deployable structure because you expand it both directions. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's one of the other things. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Thing, you know, to calculate the all these uh, classical structure properties, you no, know, such as the Poisson ratio for this kind of. Uh, of the structure that's that's quite interesting so we have a question it's written in the chat i don't know if you can actually read it otherwise oh, I, I will read for you i don't think i have an option to see a chat um it's not where it normally is anyway <laughs> uh okay so <laughs> no problem i will i guess this is the uh, academic teams so it's quite different so i've read some things about how scientific are using machine learning to learn about uh, increased of proteins in our body could we use that knowledge to use it in space or to apply this to uh, origami structures? Is it useful? No. Have you read anything about this? Yes, actually. Uh, let, let me skip back to a relevant thing to point at. Uh, this one will do. Um, so this is actually, I kind of did something similar-ish in my PhD. I am not clever enough to understand machine learning in depth. And so I didn't no, well, follow yes, down the yeah, path. <laughs> That's um, my experience. <laughs> but if you let's say you have this this sheet here. And you decide that you want to put an actuator on one of these folds. Uh, well, which fold do you put it on? You have a lot of different combinations. So <clears throat> let in, oh, it's not just one of the fold. It's on a, a set of the folds. You want to distribute these actuators across the structure. So you might want uh, one there, one there, one there, one over here. But how do you know where to put them? And there's actually, if you do the maths, you in a four by four, it is order of trillions of trillions of possible combinations of where you put the actuators. And so that's where machine learning can really come in. Um, so I just used a genetic algorithm, basic optimization, um, when I was looking at this. Um, but something like machine learning could really understand the problem of um, how you would select, how you would choose where these actuators should be to actually efficiently get the shape that you want. 
Uh, so to put it into context of a bad design might be to put them all in this back left corner because they're all focused in one place and so the rest of it doesn't deploy. You've got to have some way of spreading them across the structure um, to efficiently deploy without too many or without too much energy. Um, it depends on your application, what is your constraint? Because obviously more, actuation, more actuators cost more money and more weight. Um, but if you only have a few, they might need to put a lot more energy in to actually push it to the shape that you want. And so there's possibly a trade off between the two. Um, if you, you've probably got a limit on weight and you've probably got a limit on power uh, and trying to use machine learning with those constraints in this huge design space um, might be quite an interesting avenue for a future direction. Hmm. That's actually so regarding future directions, now you mentioned uh, if someone wants to keep on working on this, uh, which uh, lead you will recommend? Well, it depends what you're in. I think what I would recommend, because there's so much of a field, is something that really excites you. I mean, it's a very awkward question. I'll come to some specific things in a second, but just generally, you will do better if you are excited by what you're researching, because you will just be more engaged with it. And so finding an application like, um, for me, it's this kind of thing. And this is quite an important area, I think, is um, these deployable habitats. So uh, one of the challenges of this might be um, the, the challenge of, OK, we've got this idea of, of deploying it, but the space environment is really hostile. And so how do you choose the materials um, and the way in which you construct it to be usable in those that you've got all the radiation, you've got atomic oxygen, you've got um, it's a vacuum, you've got um, the massive heat and cold cycles in space. And how do you make the most of the origami despite those challenges is one really interesting avenue. Uh, and that's one of the things that is the bridge between academia and industry is that rather than thinking of it in the sterile environment, you know, which is what a lot of that's what my PhD was. The origami was in a very perfect model. There's no nothing going on on the outside. You're just looking at the origami um, and trying to bridge that with actually this is in the real world. What are the real world challenges and connecting the two? Um, yeah, I think that's one of the really good uh, potential areas. One of the other ones is the manufacturing side and trying to come up with a neat way of folding everything together. So if I put my camera on, I don't know if it pops up. Uh, I'll stop yeah, sharing so that I'm full screen. There we go. Uh, hello, everyone. This is my face. Um, <laughs> so this is this is a, a Mura Ori piece of origami. And you can see how the whole thing needs to fold together. And so coming up with some way of folding all of that together is going to be one of the real challenges. Because if you if you think about this, when I was folding this, it was really hard because how do you reach the middle with your hands without completely moving everything else? Um, and so coming up with some novel and unique way of putting that together um, is going to be a really interesting avenue as well. So there's just two uh, little ones, but the, the biggest one at the top is find something that's exciting and run with that. Yeah. that also, the machine learning one was a good idea too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's quite the topic nowadays, no? But there are yeah. always more stuff. OK, so we have another question here regarding fatigue. How How is uh, this kind of structures constrained? How are these kind of structures constrained by fatigue uh, compared to traditional structures? Have you studied any of this? Do you have any kind of? Um, more personal experience than explicitly studied because, again, I have more tools in my, more toys in my shed. Um, yeah, I will do the same. So, <laughs> um, so this one's so th this one's made out of like a. This is a PET. It's the if you've ever been to like a festival or something, the wristbands that they give you that are like paper but they're not paper. That's what this material is. 
Uh, this one is actually paper. Um, and the problem that I had with this is that it, it does damage and, and break at the folds when you use it over and over and over again. Um, and so it is a really interesting, if you the application that you're interested in has a lot of cycles, then that's another great, you, you come up with all, all very, you know, in the question, some very good avenues for future work here. Um, that's a great thing to consider is, is the application of it, because you're right that this has to go through quite a lot, a large motion each cycle. If you're sorry, I'm not on camera, I'm just looking at it. Um, a large motion each cycle as you're folding and unfolding. Um, and so fatigue would definitely be a problem unless your application is something like that space fly unit where that might fold and unfold 10 times in its life if it had 10 flights, in which case fatigue is less important in that particular application. Uh, so it really depends on how many times you're going to use it, I think is the other the big point. But yes, good thought. OK, another question we have here. Uh, so could you explain what would be the main drawbacks of an origami structure used in a solar on a solar array compared to traditional uh, solar array uh, folding? Maybe? Okay. So I'd say especially in the space industry, um, Apart from the, the drawback of manufacturing, which is, is a real challenge for the origami things, is there's things in space are a very long way away from a mechanic. Um, and they just, once they're up there, they're extremely expensive. And if they break, they break. And so it's very hard to persuade someone to use your novel and new idea when they've got one that's worked for years. Your novel and new idea might be better. It might it might save the money. It might mean that you can get a bigger solar array than you could otherwise. But if you can't prove to them categorically that it will work, a 100% guarantee, I've, shown, I've done it 10 times already and it worked every time, then it's going to be very challenging to persuade them to take the risk. Um, and I think that's one of the, um, the big drawbacks related to a conventional solar array. Um, Although there is still risks in the conventional solar array as well. Uh, when they were unfolding the solar array for the space station, astronauts actually had to go outside on EVA, on a spacewalk, to do the unfolding themselves, which is risky. That's about the riskiest thing you can do in space. And then to add to that, one of the astronauts put their hand through the panel and ripped it. So they had to send up another. Um, and so there is risk involved in that as well. And so. I think that the challenge is to prove that the origami is less risky than the current alternative. And that's the real drawback of origami at the moment compared to conventional solar panels, is that nobody's been able to prove that it's less risky than what we do already in a very risk averse industry. So uh, yes, I will ask you something and then if nobody asks anything else, I think it's already time to finish, but if anyone asks, uh, for me, it's no, it's no problem. For you, it's no problem. We can keep on. Uh, what is What are your line of work uh, in, in Vito Space? What are you working on right now? Just to be a little bit curious. If you can talk about it, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, my, my, the thing that I personally work on is a bit of everything. It's quite nice. Um, but my, my job is is simulation of all sorts. Uh, so simulation of thermal structural control systems um, uh, or whatever. Uh, the particular um, focus at the moment uh, this week to just, you know, a snapshot in this week um, is we're trying to understand how to point our platform in the right direction. Um, and so we, we've been doing some experiments. We've got like a scale model of our platform in, in the office, uh, and we've been uh, but we've been doing that. You know, actually pointing it, doing some experiments, uh, and trying to correlate that back to some uh, control system models. Uh, and obviously, the real world is not the 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 nice assumed world that we have in our model. So you come back, that you face the challenges, you try and. Uh, implement them and capture the physics better. Uh, and the idea is that we can then take the next step. And so say that, right, we've captured what we did on the small scale really well. So we can use this newly developed model that we've got for the small scale and use that to design the big one. 
and then take that step rather than designing the big one going oops oh, that wasn't right we can actually have that the the confidence that we have more accuracy in the big one uh, so that's the snapshot from this week but it's nice and varied <laughs> I was thinking more on uh, just trying to implement these ideas and to just to test it with uh, these near space conditions, right? You can actually kind of convince people that this actually works. Yeah, yeah. We we have this summer. Um, we have a, an intern coming. Uh, unfortunately, uh, none of your students will be able to apply because it's funded by the UK Space Agency. So it's students in the U in UK universities can apply. Uh, but they'll be working on something like the, the habitat, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the idea is that they'll be looking at um, deployable origami in space. And so that first step that they would be hopefully taking would be to look at some of those environmental factors of space, some of the constraints that space puts on origami, uh, thinking about what, you know, using a systems engineering approach, what does and what does a space station module need just like trying to define those requirements and then thinking well how does origami fit those needs you know and trying to on paper at least show that it would work uh, and then maybe on a scale model and then uh, you're right we have the capability to start putting things near space so maybe that might <laughs> might grow in that direction it would be nice to uh, but just for this summer, the, the next step is um, do it on paper and start mm. to actually think about the uh, the implication of doing these things in space. OK, so, well, as I mentioned to you, uh, this is a little, a little of, uh, a marketing publicity. If you want to propose these kind of topics, we can actually try to share some uh, no, final degree thesis or whatever and work on that. Uh, OK. But, OK, that, that's just step by step, as I see, you know? First yeah. we show it that you know, paper works, then we go for the thing, small scale, then bigger scale. OK, so at least from my side, that will be all. Thanks, out for, for being here and sharing your knowledge. And I really appreciate mm -hmm. the, this little chat we have. If anyone else wants to ask anything, otherwise we could cut the transmission. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everyone for coming and, and listening to me talk about origami. I know that it's a slightly unconventional um, subject, but I hope that I've convinced some people that it's an exciting subject. Okay.